Okay, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events, extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with Jeff Kelly, big data analyst, chief analyst at Wikibon's uh, big data practice. And we're here with Lawrence Schwartz, the uh, vice president of marketing at Antunity. Welcome back to theCUBE, CUBE alumni. Appreciate Thanks. it. It's always good to be back here. Um, you know, this show, uh, Percona Live, is really not on the radar for the, a lot of the mainstream shows, and we've been talking about it all morning. There's so much going on in big data, under the, under the covers and cloud, converged infrastructure, a lot of action at the data layer, databases, MySQL, NoSQL. They're not mutually exclusive, but a lot of action's happening, so I want to get your perspective. Obviously, you know, we always commentate with you about big data. Sure. Um, but now we're under the hood. Mm -hmm. So, um, Let's get into that, yep. and what's the news here? You guys have some news and some trends that are happening here. Let's go into the news first, and then give us your take on the trends. Absolutely, yeah, so we've actually, um, it's been an exciting week for us. We've had a couple of announcements. Uh, the first one, very relevant to the show, you know, we support at Attunity all sorts of data movement and replication from um, any type of database, whether it's Oracle, SQL Server, into the data warehouses, when you go into um, Teradata or Vertica, the whole, the whole lot. And we've had a lot of customers using it to, to move their data around. Um, and what we've seen is, you know, MySQL is yet another source and target that people have in their data center and they've wanted to use with our product, kind of have the one replication solution to, to manage it all. Um, so this week we uh, announced support for MySQL, which is uh, in part why we're here. Um, and it's been great when you talk about you know, big data and how do you collect the data, right? A lot of the data um, that you see with MySQL comes out of uh, you know, web applications. People are using it to um, run their online operations. They want to maybe pull that into a larger data warehouse and do a number of different types of analytics and we can help with that. So it's a, it's a bigger piece of the overall story. So Gardner's put out some new studies that you know, IT spending's up, Oracle stocks hitting an all-time high, software's back. Yeah. Data's at the, at the center of all this. So, so talk about this data movement trend. We were commenting on our intro about you know, mobile first, now Microsoft's jumping on the bandwagon with their CEO Satya Nadell saying cloud right. first. Yeah. Well, we're calling it data first because now data's at the center of the value proposition when you talk sure. about the asset and, and the web scale SQL stuff that was announced mm -hmm. with you know, Google Google, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, really shows that, that companies are using data as really a primary part of their value and competitive advantage. Unlike the old model of parking it away and then retrieving mm -hmm. for it when you need it, whether sure. it's you know way all out in the data warehouse or it's just on, you know, on disk somewhere. So speed, mm -hmm. relevance, asset sure. is, is the new normal. Yeah. Um, describe folks out there, why is, it, why is that the case and what's the, the key bottlenecks from, from this hitting a mainstream message. Sure, sure, no, I, I think uh, it's a, uh, you, you've got a lot of interesting points there and you talk about data as a source. You know, one of the things that uh, you hear a lot of people talk about are things like data lakes, right? How do I manage all this massive amounts of data, uh, work with it, do analysis on it, run it through Hadoop or whatnot. Um, but one of the things that um, also people have to work with is, you know, where do they get the, pull the data from? Is it from, you know, sensor data? Is it from remote places? It's, um, is it from somewhere else in the data center or another uh, across town data center? So all those questions become important in figuring out, you know, where to source all this. Um, and so if you think of the, the tradition, you know, the data lake model that people like to use, what are the, uh, how do you feed that? Where are all the tributaries? Where are all the streams that go into it? Um, and that's something we see our customers struggle with, right? How do you manage all that coming together? Um, and that's of course about, it's, you know, if you're going to have a data lake, how do you fill it, right? You know, how do you source the data? Um, and that's where we see bottlenecks and that's where we kind of simplify for customers. Yeah, well, yeah, that's interesting because the whole idea, you know, kind of, the old way of data management was a lot of, created a lot of silos. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit in our last segment about a lot of MySQL deployments in, uh, were kind of siloed, Oracle databases were siloed, and now with the data lake concept or data hub, whatever you want to call it, um, the whole idea is to integrate these these different sources and targets, but as you say, it gets, gets complicated. You've got to get data from point A to point B at the right time, mm -hmm. uh, use the right method. How are you helping companies do that? I mean, that, that it seems to me, sure. while, while the, the, the idea of, well, let's integrate these all these data sources and let's break down the siloed walls, sounds right. great, but actually yeah, doing no. it sounds like, well, that's a real complex shop. Absolutely, yeah, and, and it's interesting, because 
people look into their toolkit and they often say, what do I have to move data around, right? What's the traditional tools? And a lot of companies who have a, a multitude of databases or data warehouses, they kind of reach into their toolkit and they pull up a, uh, an ETL tool, you know, and ETL tools have been around for 20 plus years now. Um, but those are very complex to use. There's a lot of scripting involved in it. Um, the technology for those are, are kind of dated and they're based on more of a batch oriented process. Look, let me pull the data out here, get an intermediate server for a touchdown, do transformations and move it over. But when you have all these new sources and targets, just look at the number of data you know, warehouses that have grown in the last few years. How do you make that really simple? And that's kind of our value prop, that we come in there. Instead of having you know, a command line driven interface, it's all GUI driven, so it's very easy easy to kind of pick your target and source, pick your tables and just get started. And if you're managing a kind of a best in breed enterprise environment, you have all these sources and targets, that becomes essential. You, you don't have necessarily the, the expertise on each platform. So that's one thing. How do you monitor it uh, simply, right? How do you make sure the performance is good? And, and one of the challenges uh, for some of these like ETL tools is they're part of uh, bigger players, some one of the you know major uh, data companies uh, that, that are in the marketplace. Because we're an independent company, we're kind of this neutral Switzerland, if you will, um, we get very good relationships with each database vendor and data warehouse vendor, so we can work with them to kind of tune the performance, tune the loading commands to their native commands. Um, and that's how we, we differentiate, and that's how we really help people kind of move into the real-time environment instead of these traditional batch ETL mm -hmm. processes. Well, uh, another recent announcement was uh, a product called Maestro. Tell us a little bit about that, because that kind of goes into what we were just sure. talking about, about essentially orchestrating, I love the name, kind of orchestrating data flows. Yes. Um, talk about how that works, and, and again, kind of how that uh, relates to kind of the value proposition you were just mentioning. Sure, sure. So as a, as a company uh, overall, um, Fortunity, we really focus on moving any type of data anytime, anywhere is kind of our tagline. Um, so we do a lot of work not just with databases and data warehouse and structured data, but also with, with file data, whether it's you know, managed file transfer or kind of replicating web servers or things like that. And what we found uh, is that uh, when you go and think back to that stream model, right? Where do I get the data? How do I make sure it, you know, it's going down the stream and working this way? If I have a cascaded rollout of, of a file system or, or um, some web uh, development, how do I make sure that whole process is managed? Um, and there are a lot of tools that kind of handle point to point, like I want to go from here to here and kind of view it. But if you're looking at a larger environment, if you're cascading out from a, uh, a major uh, central office to you know, many remote offices, that becomes a complex you know, set of streams and rivers and all sorts of things that you have to manage and monitor. So what Maestro does is give you that single point of control, single view on all the, the data moving through there. You can kind of see the progress um, in, in kind of geographical locations and virtual environments. And you can see the progress as things are moving forward. You can set up all different types of flows and environments um, and kind of get that, that one simplified view of managing a large amount of data. I mean, it works uh, two ways too. So it's that distribution, but you could also be pulling in a lot of remote sensor data. Mm -hmm. And how do you manage that whole process and make it a periodic activity and pull it and pull it and bring it back to uh, some other source that you want to manage. So that whole process can become complex in a large enterprise, and that's what we're aiming to simplify, um, if you will, as you said, orchestrate the movement of all this data and, and, and make it um, coherent and, and uh, easy to manage. Yeah, no small feat. Yes. Uh, um, so we're here at Procona Live. Let's talk a little bit about MySQL. I know, I mean, in your sure. former life, you uh, you know, you had, you had a kind of a view on the MySQL world, and now sure. and uh, here with Attunity, mm -hmm. you know, we we saw we saw the announcement, I believe, last week around uh, the Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, Twitter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, supporting, I think they're calling it web scale SQL, essentially yes, yes. Um, a joint effort to scale SQL, uh, MySQL. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about uh, how MySQL has kind of um, ridden this wave or, or ridden the, the, the tide as uh, big data has kind of kind of been all the rage. Hadoop and NoSQL get a lot of the coverage. Right. But here we are, My, MySQL is still a critical element of the Absolutely. infrastructure of these, these huge web scale companies. Mm -hmm. um, what's your view? How has is, how is MySQL kind of held up through this big data um, paradigm? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question because uh, there's all sorts of approaches to, to managing this. I remember there was an article a few years ago where um, I think it was uh, Stonebreaker, you know, was the father of a lot of these database companies. He looked at what Facebook was doing with MySQL and said, I think the quote was, boy, if I had to manage MySQL at that scale, that would be a fate worse than death, right? He was very <laughs> skeptical of it. Um, but I think as Facebook has clearly shown in working cooperatively with the community, other places that contribute a lot to MySQL like Twitter, they've really you know, grown it and grown all the tools and support for it. 
Um, everybody has always loved MySQL for the ease of use, right? Kind of getting it going. It's very easy to understand and, and run. Um, and uh, and people have always worked very cooperatively in the community. So it's you know this is on a much larger scale, right? Both in the scale of the performance, but also in the scale of the vendors involved. Um, but it doesn't surprise me because um, at the end of the day, when you start scaling and looking at performance, um, there's a lot of NoSQL options, whether it's you know Hadoop or Mongo. But at the end of the day, you really, if you're going to repeatedly go after the data. You, you might probably want an index, right? <laughs> so um, you can go ahead and bolt that on to, uh, to uh, Hadoop or something else. Um, or you can look at you know, what are the existing tools I have and just scale that out. And people have done great things with that kind of MySQL backend. You've got companies like, um, I was talking to folks from the InfinityB here, right? They kind of use that as a backend to kind of do more of a columnar approach, right? Mm -hmm. So people have found ways to be very flexible and kind of breathe life into it. Um, and some of these big, the biggest companies really see the value, support it. You know, as you mentioned, Google, Facebook, Twitter. So I think it's a, a great idea. I think they're up to the challenge, and um, everybody would love to see MySQL used in wider use cases. So MySQL, a huge developer community. You're talking about a quarter of the DBMS developer, multi multi database developers are out there using MySQL. Hundreds of thousands of developers. Sure. So what about this new world here that in Percona Live makes? developers get the scale they need because the, we're hearing two major themes here. One, we hear Gary Ornstein from Fusion I talking about scale with web scale, SQL, mm -hmm. and some yeah. of the stuff they do non-volatile uh, compression. And the other one is flexibility, right? So sure. so and you're you're kind of you're hitting that part about the data movement. Mm -hmm. How does a MySQL developer, which tends to be much more LAMP stack developer, traditional software developer, mm -hmm. get into that kind of scale? What do you guys see there and what are you guys offering? Sure, sure. So we, um, you know, for what we handle and help is uh, when you've got um, particularly a, a large MySQL instance and you want to get it into a data warehouse, you know, quickly, right? So it could be um, a very large instance for MySQL, it could be a couple of terabytes. And how do you um, pull it in and do additional analysis of it? Um, maybe you're pulling it into Vertica or some other platform um, out there like Pivotal. So we, we can really help with managing that massive amount of data and you know, making sure it works and, and, and sings uh, harmoniously with the rest of your uh, data center. So that's the value that, that we bring and we approach that. So um, we help with that scalability, we help with moving it in. And the other piece that we also help with is when you look at RDS and what's going on in the cloud, um, so a lot of people see the value of uh, Amazon um, for whether it's Redshift or RDS, and the question is, well, how do I keep it in sync, right, with the ground, right? How do I make sure it's not just easy to load, which we do, but how do I make sure all the changes are captured, moving through the system? So we also come in and help of, you know, hey, if I want to offload some of this big data into the cloud, you know, take advantage of RDS, or maybe even do analytics on the cloud with Redshift, we can help with that as well. So it's all those kind of connection points as you scale that become important. What are some of the customer use cases you're hearing? Ones that want to be the next Facebook, want to be the next Google. Yeah. They see all that greatness and go, hey, why don't we have that? Right, right. Then they realize, wait a minute, they can't hire. it's hard to hire, yeah. hard to get the skill sets. But yes. So what, what technology and software is coming down the pike right. that's really going to help the enterprise move from, I'm buying general purpose stuff to, I don't want to say specialism or specialized software, but getting that hyperscale, web scale, mm -hmm enterprise yeah. footprint. What are they what are you hearing? What are you seeing them go to? Sure, sure. You know, we're seeing um, uh, a number of uh, activities, you know, going back to the cloud, right? People are looking to, to deploy that to, to handle the scale. Um, and there's a real value performance, you know, trade off there, which is nice that they can take advantage of. But a challenge often becomes of how do I get it there? Um, so if you look at, um, if they look at doing, say, analytics in a Redshift environment, a big question becomes, well, how easy is it to move? And we've talked to many customers that say, well, that's, we, we see the value prop there, we want to go to it, but you know, say they're going from Oracle or, or MySQL or whatnot, it could take a couple of months of developer time to kind of script it up, to code it, um, to, to build all the interfaces. So the promise is really pushed out, that time to value is not there. So you know, we see adoption of tools like that and we try to facilitate that because that's really going to help on some of the, the, the scalability, right? Um, and um, ability to, to scale up kind of on demand, um, but the tools have to be there to support it. Talk about the, the marketplace. And actually, Jeff and I were commenting on the Cloudera financing earlier, and you yes. know, so yeah. I mean, did your valuation go up because of it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, everything's going great. I mean, that's a fantastic finance. You're talking about billion dollars, 1.2 yes. billion dollar raise yes. for Cloudera. Yes. Um, who who would have saw that coming? Some huge success for Cloudera. Mm -hmm. um, does that 
kind of put a wrinkle in the, in the equation for the industry? Is that just cap table magic mojo <laughs> or it's that they're doing with Intel's getting a position? Right, Does right. that change the game? I mean, Intel's traditionally an enabling platform. Sure. Um, Cloudera certainly is open source, but there's other competition going on. Mm -hmm. um, clients on the enterprise side have have told us on the cube that they like Cloudera's involved in POCs, but you know this positioning of data warehouse business intelligence might not be yeah. their sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Although the vision's right on. So yeah. meanwhile, Hortonworks is kind of doing their thing. So did Cloudera yeah. not have the funding? You think you do you think that this is enough gas in the tank for them? Do you yeah. think they can compete with the big boys? Sure. No, obviously that that amount of money puts them in very good position to compete, um, and uh, you know, and, and when you come in there, and uh, more and more they're going to compete with the traditional database and data warehouses, right? Some of the work they do now is side by side, but over time, you know, there's definitely where am I going to spend my dollars? So um, they do, I would think, they do need the money, the capital to kind of compete with a lot of the major players who've been around for a while. So I could see them doing that. Obviously, it's a lot of money going in; it's some validation of it. Um, do I know in five years who's going to win and who's going to be left over? I think that's, I couldn't predict that. Well, I always say it's hard to go out of business when you have money in the bank. That's right. So um, that's classic. But yes, no, but this, it's, so they have the long play. So this, yeah. is, this is one of the things that Cloudera always needed. They needed that runway. Sure. And so now they've got the runway to kind of expand out. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it alienates the market at all? Do you think it, it rises the tide? Do you think it floats all the boats? Some boats sink, some boats float. <laughs> yeah. what, I, what's your take on no, it? No, I think in the short term it rises the tide. I think it, it brings everybody's awareness up of uh, what's going on in the market with, with Hadoop. Um, and it also follows what we've seen, even as a company, um, you know, we're not uh, a Hadoop distributor at all, right? But we've seen more and more people just in the past quarter asking about Hadoop, looking at the implementation. Um, and so um, I think it's a combination of the validation of money going into it, people finding the right use cases, um, all that's coming together and making it seem an, an attractive story. This is here to say. Um, so I think, uh, is, is it the right amount? I'm not a VC, but um, I think it does validate what's well, going I mean, on. Well, certainly it's insane numbers on yeah, terms yeah. of valuation or everything else, but, and it's good for the industry. So Hadoop aside, now let's move to the analytics market, okay? So, sure. so you have the analytics markets exploding. ClearStory just announced financing of $30 million for a Miller's company. Yeah. Platform just got a big round of funding. Sure. Bubble, bubble behavior aside, mm -hmm. there's real movement in the enterprise. Gardner sure. has a study out, IT spending's up. Yeah. Um, what's going on in the analytics space in your mind? What do you see there? Sure, um, it's it's an area that uh, you know people are are looking for the uh, the simplicity, the ease, right? I think places like Tableau and places like um, um, Splunk have kind of set the standard of how easy it can be to kind of mine through data and look at data. So the expectations are raised there, um, and they've shown real value with it. Is right? data scientist market really happening, or is this going to be the data analyst market? Boy, because um, that's that's always been the question: yeah. do do people really become data scientists, or yeah. do analysts become a new title called data scientist. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I'm sure there's blending of, uh, of both there, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, e either way. There's a, there's a lot of opportunity on the tool side. There's a lot of growth in, in those areas. So you think the jury's still out on that? Um, yeah, I mean, where it'll end up, I'm not sure, but um, I can see when we work with you know when we work with Amazon, for example, to go back to the cloud. Um, you know, we get pulled into you know webinars with them, with us talking about the infrastructure, people talking about like the redshift, and then working with like JasperSoft on top of that, right? So people want to know the whole story, they want to know the whole stack. So um, it is an important area. There's a lot of growth there. There's been some good open source work there too. So um, I think that's a, a, a positive market. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, Jeff and I were talking before we started. Yeah. You know, and I was talk to Dave about this from our old IT days. Rip and replace always is a hard sale. Sure. Um, but with open source, you can now incrementally get some beachhead and kind of build on that. Yeah. Um, okay, final question for you um, before we break is, sure. on information governance was a topic that came up in our crowd chat earlier today. Okay. Um, um, that we had around um, IBM Impact, big event coming up. But, mm -hmm. but that still seems to be the big uh, thing that everyone's trying to get their arms around. And so, I mean, everyone kind of knows it's important. Yeah. Policies is a top down, bottoms up. Sure. Uh, what's your take on data governance? Because data obviously will be at the center of the value proposition and there'll be movement, different virtual machines, you know, all this stuff's happening. Yeah. What's going on with data, data governance? Boy, yeah, I, I um, you know, I, I see, uh, you know, people that we work with at the application level kind of, you know, wondering about that, looking for the support of it, whether it's, um, you know, where they store it or the security on it. Um, but um, you know the overall market and what's happening there. Um, 
I'm going to have to look at what you're working on. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's something we haven't we haven't seen as the infrastructure company as much, but I know it's uh, coming up more and more at the app level. So, so overall application, you're seeing a lot of data. You see New Relic made a big strategy change. They're putting some big data out there. You're seeing data in the applications. Are you seeing that too? Um, yeah, and, 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 and New Relic's an interesting one because uh, they're at the point now where uh, I was listening to a uh, streaming music service up in my room, and I'm hearing advertisements, you know, from New Relic, right? So. They're showing up uh, quite a bit. They're uh, carpet bombing Facebook too and Twitter and yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's amazing. With Spotify it, or Pandora? Uh, it was uh, no, it was Slacker that. Was oh, okay. <laughs> but the interesting thing was for for these new relic guys. I remember it was actually a Procona show in New York a few years ago where um, I was at my last company and they had this little table next to ours and um, it's amazing and and uh, kudos to them for their growth. So. Lawrence, thanks for coming inside the cube. Great, great to have you. Great to get your perspective. You see in the landscape out there, the big data is a key part of it. You got to store it in a database, and um, scale is the number one priority. This is the cube. We are exploring that conversation and more here live in Santa Clara Convention Center, Heart of Silicon Valley. Be right back with our next guest after this short break.